as a teacher, I am used to teaching one person. So long as there is one willing person, we begin our class. And uh, please do tell you our friends that uh, when we get into professional life, soft skills and sticking to the basics will get us a long way. One of it is punctuality and I guess I was like that of your age, but you do tell that to your other colleagues when you see them. All right. They can join us later. That's fine. Now, in the last class, I was trying to talk to you about the changes that has taken place across the world. WTO, TRIPS Agreement, Trade in Services. Trade in Services means, uh, Services means IP comes into the play. Article 27 of the WTO TRIPS Agreement. International minimum standard in the protection of industrial property. It is in this context we have to assess what skills are expected of us as IPR professional. This is the main focus of the discussion and I will also look at you know how does it affect the academics also. Now I want you to understand that um, till 1995, Indian IPR profession was highly monopolized. 1995 is a real, what do you call, turning point. Okay. That is when we become members of the WTO and the Narasimha Rao government, uh, Vajpayee government and uh, a lot of what you call globalization, a tilt that takes place. At that point of time, if you had been an IPR lawyer like me, you know, I was, you know, um, I actually, I was an IPR lawyer, all right. I began as an IPR lawyer, worked with IPR law firms, I've been there, done that, given lectures, participated in litigations, in all the forums, and therefore I think, you know, uh, I can... I have something to talk to you about this actually, which I guess will make your learning process lots easier. All right, what is the general scenario of an IPR professional? Suppose you become a uh, postgraduate in LLM IPR. What next? If you are not into teaching, if you have to get into teaching, you have to pass the UGC net examination. If you are not going to get into teaching, all right, you join either a corporate office or a law firm, isn't it? I have my suggestion to all of you will be, even if you want to specialize in IPR, be a trial lawyer, okay, a litigation lawyer, at least for one year before really choosing your specialization because you all must uh, have a feel of how the system works, okay? Uh, you can't, the system is not going to adjust for you. However smart, competent uh, we think we are, okay? That is something, unless we conform to the system in a, a broad sense, okay? We are not going to really make a headway there. Now having said that, the options are very, very limited. You either become a, join a law firm or join a multinational company. In both the places, you don't really acquire the skills of a small and medium entrepreneur interface. That is a topic that Professor Ramir Khan had given me and I want to stick to it. Now the topic is very thoughtful, I appreciate it. See, in my last lecture I mentioned you that in 1980 the economies of India and China were more or less very similar. By 1995 they were about three or four times ahead. By 2027 or ten times ahead in terms of sheer economic power actually. Now because of this, what has a, this growth of China, how did it take place? Small and medium entrepreneurs, you know. China became the manufacturing hub of the world actually, okay. 
Now, so small and medium entrepreneurs have a very important role to play. The company that you talk today, Infosys, okay, you heard about it? Narayan Murthy, okay, garage startup. Then, Kiran Mazumdar Shah, have you heard of her? Who is she? Who is she? Speak loud, lady. Kiran Mazumdar Shah, haven't you heard of her? I am not hearing you. Uh, okay, she is a biocard lady. I am not hearing you, lady. I know that you are trying to speak actually. But I am uh, not hearing you at all. Are you hearing me? Are you all hearing me? Pooja, I am not hearing you. You have been trying to speak to me. Never mind. Uh, let me go ahead. I, this is an interactive business in this uh, video classes with the various factors we have, I know, are difficult actually. Now, the point I'm trying to tell you is whether it is uh, Ready Lab, Sun Pharma, uh, Bharat Biotech, uh, Biocon, Infosys, a lot of other Baiju, right? Have you heard, haven't you heard of Baiju? Zomato, right? All these are, they begin as small and medium entrepreneurs, okay? And thereafter, they try to scale it up to the national level. Uh, in a company like Uber, something that touches the life of many of you when you go to, when you live in a city, okay? A car aggregator. This is a business model evolved by an young entrepreneur, small and medium entrepreneur, which gets scaled up by a company like Reliance, okay? So, in all these uh, areas, you know, what we see as uh, uh, bull weather unicorns today, the big companies like Microsoft, IBM, Google, okay? All these companies, Pfizer, all these that you see, these uh, bull weather unicorns, all began as startup. Maybe Coca-Cola, okay, 150-year-old company. But another company called Pepsi, something that started probably in 1940s, you know, overtook and uh, giving a real run for money to the Pepsi. In all these areas where you find that uh, there is a lot of what you call IPR roles. All right. Uh, you are you have to pick up some skills to advise small and medium entrepreneurs okay uh, somebody uh, who is starting a travel agent and coming up with a new software that will combine him air ticket booking sightseeing ticket buying everything all comprehensive online assistance okay he is wanting to put it up and uh, he takes money from each one of these service providers and he knows the seasons, and he knows the rates. So, what kind of IPR protection that this man is looking for? Or, there is one person who is working on plant-based product, okay? Uh, he is able to make good quality oil, okay? I, I don't know what oil all of you use, and uh, how careful you are about the oil that you are using. Because there is a movement that uh, the expelled chemical oils which are treated with uh, purifications are not good and many of them are carcinogenic and they are going back to the old methods of extraction of organic oil or they are introducing new technology like you know cryogenics okay the heat that is generated in the expulsion of the oil spoils the nutrients so therefore he is introducing a new whatever uh, you, 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 you know that uh, people permit jaggery instead of sugar if you are a diabetic actually. So, you have a sudden revival of different forms of jaggery. In that jaggery, there is a value added jaggery. Something that has got ginger. Something that has got pudina. Okay. So, like, see, what I am trying to tell you is these kind of inventions originate, 
only with small and medium entrepreneurs. Okay. Or he is coming up with a method of an organic farming. Okay. In one or two acre, giving him an assured income of about one lakh a month from each acre. Something unbelievable. Not many farmers make something like 10,000 rupee or 15,000 rupee per acre after having worked there. For, uh, so, the topic which I am discussing is, it is a small and medium entrepreneurs that uh, generate a lot of invention and these inventions may be scalable also. For example, pasteurization of milk. I want to ask you girls, I mean, do you buy your milk in bottles or plastic sachets or a milkman comes and delivers it to you? Which one of the three? Which one of the plastic packets, right? All right. Okay. Uh, in many parts of India, still, uh, there is a common point where people go and buy milk. Or the milk is delivered. Two types of milk is delivered. Pasteurized milk, non-pasteurized milk. Okay. Uh, pasteurization is good. And uh, there are... So the point is, if I am a cattle owner which, uh, uh, which uh, produces only about 5 or 10 liters of milk or 20 liters of milk a day, I need a pasteurizing machine which... Uh, will pasteurize just 5 or 10 liters, 15 liters, 20 liters. But the plants we have today are 5,000 liters, 3,000 liters. So miniaturizing technology. So what I'm trying to tell you, if somebody is using that, what is pasteurization as the process? You have to boil the milk to about 150 degrees Celsius and then suddenly cool it. So you need an equipment which will heat the milk and simultaneously cool the milk. You will have a cooler, you will have a heater and you will put it in a container and you give it in a box where the farmer is able to pasteurize the milk that he produces for the consumption of his own family because tuberculosis, primary complex, a lot of diseases uh, children pick up when they drink unpasteurized milk. So this kind of technology, when he comes up with that, number one, he is entitled for a patent. This is how he comes to you as a professional. See, I have invented a yes, miniature pasteurizing, milk pasteurizing unit, which you can plug it in your three-phase socket and then go do your work after about one hour, uh, of loading, I get about 10 liters of pasteurized milk and thereafter there can be a lot of value adding that can be done to a milk use. I told you, India is one of the biggest producer of milk uh, and uh, still our milk consumption per capita is lower. And so I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is an invention, a rural invention, which will have a bearing on uh, the development. For example, uh, Amur Kurian is hailed as a hero. Padma Bhushan, Bharat Ratna, everything deserves because he brought a lot of prosperity to the rural women. And uh, prosperity that he brought to the rural women uh, improved uh, the overall quality of life in Gujarat. So when you talk about Gujarat today, you know that this big uh, industrial consumerist model is not possible except for the overall prosperity that Mr. Uh, Kurian had brought actually. All right. Uh, now I don't uh, see you. Uh, is there, are you hearing me? Or is there a technical problem? Mohammed Khan, Himanshi? Yeah, I think there is some issue, sir. Huh? There seems to be an issue. Is the, our net has gone or what? Uh, our net is proper only, sir. Perfect, huh? Yes, sir. One second. Oh, we find it too.
Are you test done? Eh? Are you all right? Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. No, you can talk. Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. Abba, were you hearing me at all in the first place? No. When I was speaking earlier. We lost one or two minutes. That's all. That's all. Again, okay. Ah. All right. All right. Let me. Yeah. All right. Now uh, the point I'm trying to uh, impress upon is the person has come up with an invention. He is seeking your consultant as an IPR professional. What should you do? See, please remember in all IPR, the most important skill is documentation. And please remember, IPR is all about specification. Documentation is important. Specification is important. And uh, let me tell you, these are essentially the two skills that Indians lack as a group actually. I'm telling you the documentation. What are the sources of Indian law? Shruti and Smriti. What is Shruti? Shruti is heard. And what is Smriti? Smriti is spoken. Nobody talks about writing. <laughs> you understand? Eh? Indian language, Sanskrit, did not have a script for a long time. <laughs> they are, I'm telling you, this is, this is something, you know, Indians have poor documentation skills. I'm telling you, we have to uh, accept that. And we are very, very flexible. There was a joke, you know, that one Indian said, you know, uh, we eat in India through nose. How do you do it? Just one inch below the nose. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So, this is not uh, specification, okay? Eh? Documentation is important and specification is important. Now, how do you write a patent specification? This is the starting point of a skill. You don't have to write it, but you must know how to scrutinize it. At least, uh, unless you know how it is written, you may not know how to scrutinize it actually. Now, how first is, first job is seeking an invention disclosure from the client. Okay, uh, patent skills are number one is uh, documentation, number two specification, your specification is going to depend upon the invention disclosure document. Now, this is where you as a lawyer can play a role. See, you are not a scientist or technologist. Okay, You are simply working in a company which is involved in science or technology. So, firstly you have to recognize that patent law is about 80 to 90 percent science and technology and just 10 percent law. So you are not a prima donna there. You understand what I am saying? Eh? You are going to play only a secondary and a supplementary role to the main business of development of technology and the developed technology has to be commercialized. For the technology to be commercialized, you as a lawyer has got a minor supplementary role to play there. So we recognize that we are not prima donna there. And we cannot uh, uh, substitute technical writing. Okay. So what we should do? We should ask for an invention disclosure. What are the parts of an invention disclosure? Number one, uh, an invention disclosure should not be more than about five to seven pages. Okay. It must be short enough. So if I am going to give you a 10 page article to read, most of you will not read. If I tell you to read one or two pages, you will read. Because I understand, you know, there are a lot of uh, issues actually that demands our time. So what I am going to say, I am going to say in about three to 5,000 words, this is the starting point in the documentation skills that I was talking about. So what you should do, Number one, an invention disclosure should have following part. First part is area of the invention. Okay. 
area of invention. This is a telecommunication technology. This is a pharmaceutical technology. In pharmaceutical, this is a vaccine technology. In pharmaceutical, this is a nutritional supplement technology, whatever, okay. What is the area of invention? Uh, please remember, I don't know how many of you have read the specification. It's quite possible that most of you would not have read. Uh, reading a patent specification is not like reading a John Grisham novel. Okay. A John Grisham novel is interesting. I very strongly recommend that you read John Grisham. Actually, you can learn lots of law from John Grisham. But it is not going to be as interesting as reading a John Grisham, actually. Because this is work, okay? Specific work. So, first part of your area of invention is... Uh, area of, first part of the invention disclosure is area of invention. The second part is status of the prior art. See, this word, prior art, you will hear in patent law again, again, again and again. Because a patent is for an improvement over prior art. So for you to exactly determine the scope of the area of your monopoly, you should know the status of the prior art. Prior art means the body of knowledge available to humanity on the area of invention. Okay. How much uh, is there? All right. Uh, how much of knowledge is there? And where do you find the prayer art? There are three ways. Nowadays, Google is here. Uh, you just have to go to Google and do a search. There are three types of searches. One is prayer claiming. Whether the technology that your client says he has invented has already been claimed by any of the existing patent, granted patent, pending application. Then, prior publication. Sometimes, universities publish information and that information can become the starting point of the technology of the inventor. In that case, by prior publication, that invention is anticipated. Third is, prior public use. If the product uh, that your client is giving employs a technology which is already used in the market, it may not come in the category of a prior patented product or a prior published product, but it, there has been a prior public use. If there is a prior public use, then there will not be a patent. You know that a patent is granted for complying with the four requirements, novelty, utility, non-obviousness and statutory subject matter. For determining novelty, you have to discuss about the prior art. Okay? When you are talking about writing an invention disclosure, starting point is area of the invention. The second is status of the prior art. Then the third part of the invention disclosure is problems with the prior art. If the prior art is enough and sufficient, there is no need for your invention, isn't it? Actually, every patent is for an improvement over the pre-existing technology. Okay, so uh, if you are looking at one product, for example, I remember, I saw mobile phones in 1980. One mobile phone will be this big actually, you understand? It used to come up with a uh, what do you call strong wire and it would carry about one, one and a half and for you to speak, you know, it would cost you something like 15 rupees per minute or whatever. It was a big status symbol, only big guys had it. Nowadays, you are having a mobile phone, a smart Android phone for I think 3000 rupees, Jio is going to give it. So what happens? After the introduction of the mobile phone technology, there has been a lot of further incremental innovation. Mobile phone, camera, radio, MP3 player, calculator, uh, word processor, uh, health monitor. You know, you have the Android phone which enable you to monitor how many steps you have walked, 
how much you have traveled in car, how many floors you have claimed, all that, you know. Uh, people are counting calories. So, same phone that you are having is performing a lot of functions. So, what I am trying to tell you is, uh, you are going, third part of your invention disclosure is problems with the prayer art. Okay, what are the, there are, you have got a product and there is very useful and uh, the usefulness of this product can be further improved by doing the following. So, please remember, a patent is for uh, improving the commerciability and saleability of a product. Earlier you had to have one radio, one phone, one calculator, one video player, all houses had all that. Now you don't even go to a TV. You have a phone and you have a data pack, whether you want to watch YouTube, Google or listen to classes, right? Yeah? So, this is what we call in information technology a convergence, okay? Now, for me to become a broadcaster today, all what I have to have is a smartphone. I can make a, a video of my smartphone and I can supplement the audio after having taken the video and thereafter give it to professional editors and thereafter hire a music technician to give the background music. So, if I have a, what you call, smartphone, I become a public broadcaster. So, the point I am trying to impress upon here is, in the patent specification, you add what are the problems with the prior art and which of the problems you propose to solve. This is the third part of the invention disclosure. Then, how do you solve the problem? This is the fourth part of the invention disclosure. The problem solving can happen by a device. The problem solving can happen by a method. The problem solving can happen by a process. The pro easy, there can be many methods of solving a problem. Then you tell, how, how, what do you, object of the invention. You are talking about the area of invention, problems with the status of the prior art, problems with the prior art, which of the problems you propose to solve and how you exactly solve the problem. And thereafter, you, in always in patent law, we always say that uh, if possible, incorporate drawings as possible. Because patent law is all about specification. And we always say one page of drawing is enough, is equivalent to about four or five pages of disclosure. Okay. Uh, so, we always refer to drawings, okay, and patent office tells you how to submit drawings. And thereafter, you have what is called as a claim. This where uh, you as a lawyer start playing a role. Till this time, it is a job of a technologist. Area of invention, status of the prior art, problems with the prior art, how you propose to solve the problem, is it an, or a product or a process or a method or a device and is it a catalyst, whatever, okay, you can there are, and thereafter you are writing the claim. So, this is the seventh part of a patent specification. You as a patent lawyer play a role only in this part. So, unless you are able to draw the right information from the innovator, you will not be in a position to uh, have the necessary skills to advise a young innovator. All right. Then, let me tell you, uh, patenting in India today is like cricket in India during 1960. Okay. Uh, 
today uh, indian cricket team is one among the very best in the world okay we are good in all the three formats even though we have lost the 2020 match but in 1970s you know when i was a cricketer myself india had never won a match here let me tell you that you know uh, when we go and uh, watch matches in the cricket stadium if india draws the match we all will think we have won actually okay eh? that was really the scenario and indians have never recorded a win outside their country you know the first country whom we defeated in a test match is new zealand they are playing a match against us today actually all right and uh, west indies means they will always beat us by an innings and uh, 200 runs that's how they will beat us actually and uh, uh, our b- b- batsmen you know they were not having those uh, fanciful guards and all that they get beaten by west indian bowlers bouncers left right and center uh, compelling people to you know evolve uh, head guards and they are all inventions in cricket elbow guards okay uh, 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 anyway the point i am trying to tell you here is patenting game in india we are not really convenient you understand we still don't have the trained human resources in the country i'll give you an illustration you all will have a good career option in ipr if you develop a scientific bent of mind okay i i know that i am a lawyer i wanted to be a scientist i scored very badly during my graduation i did not get an msc seat i became a lawyer after i became a lawyer i thought i'll stay in touch with technology and i became a patent lawyer that's actually the reality of life actually but i'm not regretting it so it is not that for you to be a patent lawyer you must be a great scientist or anything like that not at all okay you you are trying to really compile information from different sources take the information put it together in a format and that is what the legal compliance all about actually okay now let me tell you uh, you must uh, make your uh, presentations readable and watchable this is very very important actually for you to make the presentation readable you must understand who are the type of people who are going to read your patent specification i told you in the early part of my class that reading a patent specification is not like reading a john grisham novel it's not going to be interesting actually okay it is a, but who will read it number 1 the examiner in the patent office will read it because he should check for novelty utility non obviousness and statutory subject matter he has to read it government of india pays him to do that Uh, he is at least a person skilled in the art he can understand the jargons that you are talking about and thereafter it will be read by the controller of patent controller of patent true he has got a scientific bent of mind but he may not have the domain expertise of that branch for example i may be an electronics engineer and if you are going to give me an organic chemistry molecule i am as dumb as a history student you understand between us there is not going to be much of a difference so the second person who is going to read he is not a person skilled in the art this is again a catch phrase that you will come very often in patent law number 2 the first examiner will read next controller will read to decide whether you are going to get the patent or not and the third who is going to read is somebody called a venture capitalist you know the big business uh, when a medium enterprise becomes a big enterprise is a question i told you most of the enterprise start as a small enterprise become how many of you have heard of this uh, company nike you use their product what have you heard about her can some of you speak to me about this company puja i am seeing you nike so basically it is a company that has a collection of different brands and it sells okay do you know the name of the lady who sponsored it do you know the name of the lady who sponsored it sir i read a few days ago 
Himanshi, can you tell something about her? Kanika, do you know anything about her? Sir, her name is Falguni Nayar, so she was working for Very good, very good, very good. You are, you are giving a relevant information. Himanshi, you don't try their product. Uh, yes, sir. So she was recently in news because uh, the... Oh, we are not able to see you. Have you heard about it, Professor Khan? Falguni Nayar. Yes, sir. See, she is a very interesting lady. Uh, uh, being a lady, she was very, uh, what do you call, concerned and cautious about the beauty care products that were made in India. Uh, she was an investment banker to begin with, actually. And uh, she was making money, so she had more disposable income. So she had also had... Uh, Comfortably, she spent a lot of money on her own beauty enhancing product. And then she realized that there is a big market in it. You know what? Uh, you, you, when, when you talk about uh, Aishwarya Rai, right? You know her, right? Do you remember Sushmita Sen? Uh, okay, these were supposed to be the beauty queens of India. And the irony is that within one year you have one Miss Universe, one Miss World, one Mrs. World, uh, one Mrs. Forty World and uh, Grandmother's World, you know, World Grandmother. So you have a whole lot of competitions coming. You know why? Because Indians were getting more prosperous. They are having more disposable income. If I have more disposable income, I don't mind spending little more money to make myself more beautiful. And people like me give up at this age, come on, there is not going to make a great difference in it. <laughs> okay. Until you come to that conclusion, you are going to definitely spend a lot of money. And the amount of money that you are spending is more. So she came up with the product, Nika, right? And she is the richest self-made woman in the country. She has overtaken Kiran Mazumdar Shah. Do you know her? Who is she? Kiran? Biopan. Are you hearing me? Are you all hearing me? Yes, All right. Now, uh, this Varguni Nair has overtaken Kiran in terms of the self-made uh, woman billionaire. She is second only to Savitri Jindal. We have heard about that uh, Jindal group. Uh, one difference is Savitri Jindal inherited the money and these people made their money. So what I am trying to tell you here is, this lady had a business plan, okay, Started it as a medium entrepreneur. See this uh, in uh, uh, this medium means I am telling you in my town if somebody is having twenty employees he's a big shot. Okay, but when you use the word medium entrepreneur, you are using somebody who is going to have something like hundred employees, fifty crores in business turnover, hundred crores in business turnover. That is only a medium size undertaking. For example, you are talking about the revenue of uh, TCS, Wipro, Infosys. I am talking, you know, billions of dollars, okay? Whereas you are talking about a small and medium entrepreneur, some company that has business up to about uh, 50 crore, okay? That's a small enterprise. Some company that has business up to 500 crore, that's a lot of money actually, okay. Uh, I, the, the budget of uh, many of the universities is less than 12 or 15 crores actually in India. Now, a small enterprise is having something like uh, 50 crore, medium enterprise, see and this depends on which law you are in, okay. For uh, the Industrial Dispute Act, one criteria, for patenting, if you are a small and uh, 
medium entrepreneur. If you are a startup, there are concessions, and if you are a startup, you are entitled for an expedited examination of a patent. And the please remember. So what I am trying to tell you is, you have to see when you write the specification, it must attract a venture capitalist. That is why I mentioned to you the name of the Parguni lawyer of Nika. She had a, she had been using it as a consumer. She realized that there is a market for it, and she came up with viable, scalable models. She started as a small and medium entrepreneur, and she took venture capitalist fund, and then uh, she hit the global market with the initial public offering. Nika, okay, made her the. So this is the success story of a woman who had. Uh, Really leveraged IPR to become big, rich, and successful. In the process, she has made quite a few billionaires as well. You know, one nice thing about generating wealth is that if you are able to share that wealth with others, your your wealth multiplies. Okay, and uh, anyway. Uh, this is what uh, you have to do: patent specification. You know, appealing to the. You see, firstly, you, you are taking the input from the inventor. Secondly, you are writing it for venture capitalist, and there is somebody called a lending banker, and finally there will be a judge who is going to decide whether uh, there is an infringement if you have to sue based on the patent. So. A patent document is a multidisciplinary document. That is the most important skill I want you to pick up during this lecture. Uh, there must be something for the technologist. There must be something for the lawyer. There must be something for the venture capitalist, and there must be something for the lending banker, and that must be easily comprehensible to the jury and common man. How you are different from others? Whether the other fellow has copied you? All right. This is about the patent skills. Okay, and uh, patent prosecution is a subject by itself, and many times this is given to the law department. Okay, and many companies, uh, foreign companies like uh, uh, Pfizer, Novartis. Lily, they will hire Indian companies like Infosys, TCS, Mahindra, Mahindra, for them to follow up the patent prosecution work, and there is a lot of employment opportunities for lawyers who can demonstrate a scientific and technical bent of mind in this area. All right, this is about the patenting skill. And there is one more where you are asked to play a crucial role is licensing. See, this is a big deal. If what Google does, a hey, Google doesn't do anything here. Huh? They simply collect the information, they make a software, and they tell the people what to make, and they give the specification, and they help them to. And now uh, most of the business you do through Google, right? Huh? And uh, Google knows which part of the house where you are. Okay, whether you are in the kitchen, huh? or you are in your study room, or you are in the office. How did you move from office to your study room? Did you walk? Did you cycle? Did you ride? Because you are carrying your mobile phone, you know. Your pin is there, right? So the point I am trying to tell you here today: we are in a technologically wired world. Okay. So what you should do? What does Google do? Google has evolved a lot of software, right? They don't. Uh, IBM at least makes computers. Apple makes phones. Okay. Boeing makes aeroplane. General Motors makes car. And uh, most of these people sell their product, right? What does Google sell here? In fact, Google tried to sell a phone. I don't know if uh, you are aware of the Google phone. It was one of the 
top uh, introduction and the product paid like Microsoft you know they tried to introduce into the telephone market they came up with the iridium phone that also paid now what did they do I think Android is a Google product if I am not mistaken okay so they know that they cannot control the uh, very soon the Chinese companies became the best uh, most efficient manufacturer of mobile phone in yesterday's class, I told you about the competitive cost advantage, right? Hmm? And now, what does Google do? Google simply, and one more thing, you can buy a car, but you don't buy Microsoft Window. What do you do? You license it. And when you license it, you don't play favorites, okay? Uh, it is what you call as a standard uniform licensing practices. Fair, uniform, non-discriminatory. There may be price differential. But in terms of the services, you know, it is not like you are an important person. Therefore, I will treat you better. The other person is not so important. So, let him wait. You know, I am not going to give him the best deal. See, please remember, this is a normal thing. For example, you go to a vegetable vendor. To everybody, they will say 25 rupees. You may be her friend or yeah, whatever reason, and she may give it to you for 20 rupees. Right, that's her wish. But in licensing, if you do it, it will be considered as an unfair licensing practice. As. So, after having got the patent, how to license it? Evolving uh, standard licensing practices in compliance with the global standards. This is the next thing. Okay. All right. Uh, that is about the patenting skill. Next is the trademark. See, you are an IPR lawyer. Okay. Patent, trademark, copyright, design. A geographical indicator, everything is going to come under the IPR umbrella. Okay. Now, the, we talked about the patent skills. And the next skill that we are now talking about is the trademark skill. Okay. Trademark <coughs> is a very important asset here. See, for example, if you, uh, you know Saridon, what is Saridon? Uh, I'm sure that this is a product. Uh, uh, huh? Like, Saridon is a tablet for headache. Very good. Well, what is the company that owns Saridon? This is an IPR quiz, trademark quiz, right? Covaxin, who makes it? I am able to, uh, Himanshu, I am hearing, seeing your lips moving, but I am not hearing you. Covaxin, who makes it? Huh? Who makes Bharat it? Biotech. Bharat Biotech. Covaxin? Serum Institute. Serum Institute. Okay, like this, who makes Aridon? Ah, you know one thing, Saridon is one of the oldest trademark in the world. When I say Saridon, what is it actually? It must be something, right? It's a brand name. It's a brand name, very good. What is the generic name of Saridon? You are coming to the... You are answering my question right and I am, you are giving me a feeling that I am communicating to the class. Okay. What is the, you said the brand name. What is the generic name of Saridon? Acetyl salicylic acid. It is a chemical compound. Now, please remember when you sell it as a generic product. Acetyl salicylic acid, the price is one dollar. 
But when you sell it as Saridon, the price becomes three dollars. So, and if you ask the president of the multinational Roche, or O C H E is the name of the company that owns Saridon. Saridon is a brand which is known in 180 countries. Okay. And how does the company make money? Every time somebody is having a headache, body pain, in one of the 200 countries, first thing they think of is Saridon. So, each time somebody falls sick, Saridon makes money. How it makes? Because the consumer knows that if I have Saridon, I am going to have some relief. So, the asset of the company is not the uh, multi-million dollar plant and the 50,000 workforce and the scientists and the doctors they have. The asset of the company is the knowledge that a consumer has about the company. So what happens? Trademark is a commercial certificate on the origin of goods. Okay, it's a commercial certificate. Now, there are two things. Many companies have a mixed pipeline. For example, uh, if you are talking about a yeah, cosmetic company, what are the different cosmetics you can think of? As a man, I can think of a shaving. Shaving brush, shaving cream, aftershave lotion, right? And then moisturizer, then anti-deodorant. You understand? These are the so-called the body care products, okay? Now, when you are evolving all these things, the market never remains constant. Shampoo, hair growth oil, okay? Huh? Lustrous skin. Uh, avoid whatever they, they, you can you can add any number of you know I'm sure that uh, many of you would be frequenting the Himalayan you know have you heard of that company Himalaya huh? I'm sure many of you patronize that company also huh? uh, they have got all herbal products right and uh, so I mean earlier brand was this, uh, there was a company called Vico Laboratories. I don't know how many of you remember that. And uh, Balsara Chemicals, and uh, please remember, this is a, Falguni is an entrant to it actually, okay? Now for all these people, trademark become very, very crucial. Okay? And uh, the law department has got a lot of role to play. For example, the name Big Bazaar. Have you heard of it? Who owns this brand? Who owns this brand? It's a non future group. Huh? So it started with the future group, if I'm not wrong. Who? I can tell me again. It's a future group. Very good, yeah. You are right, Kanika. You are right. It doesn't matter. Good, okay. Is it a good trademark? I'm asking you. Sir, it's a very generic name. It has big and bazaar. Very good. I like your response. You know, I mean, I'm communicating to a class. You are talking sense to me. The name Big Bazaar, the future group had chosen as their brand, is a very poor choice from the perspective of a trademark lawyer. Because... Bazaar is generic. Okay. Big is also generic. So, the words which are generic can never be a subject matter of a good trademark. For example, apple. If you want to sell fruits, you cannot sell fruits under the brand name apple. If it becomes a brand name, you will have uh, apple bananas, apple strawberries, right? Apple jackfruits. That will become 
ridiculous. But if you are going to sell telephones under the brand name Apple, then it is arbitrary. You understand? There is no connection between the goods that you are selling, okay, and uh, the trademark that you have chosen. For example, you are in the education business. What is the big education brand in our country? Not HNLU. <laughs> is it? Eh? NLSAU is it a brand? IIT is it a brand? IIM is it a brand? Pitts Pilani is it a brand? Uh, is it, is it, uh, actually, yes. Like that, can you name some private education brands in the country? They are all on, you know, you are right, 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 right. I know kids, Kalinga Institute have been there. Amiti is again a big education brand. All right. What about the online blogs? Baiju. Sachin Tendulkar is advertising and he is uh, taking equity in Baiju. So now what happens is, I mean, I am trying, and Amazon, as you say, is going to get into digital business. Have you heard of a learning application called Udemy? U D E M Y. Have you heard of it? Yes, sir. Yes. No? Yes, sir. No. Yes. yes. Okay. Download it. Go to Google Google Play Store. Download it. And put name search R. Murali Dharan. You will find eight courses. One course on industrial property rights. 12 hours of video. 10 powerpoints, 5 or 6 blogs, and 12 hours of video exclusively on patent law. So online learning is becoming an important brand. Okay. And if any of you are going to take UGC net exam, how many of you are going to take it? Are you planning to take it? You please take it because you have to know where you stand in this competitive world. Right? We all think we studied in uh, nearby local places, prestigious colleges, fine. But when you go into get into the job market next year, we will know where exactly where we stand here. So try to take as many competitive examinations as possible. And one more thing about this competitive examination is, their examination pattern is totally different. Right? online, you know, by the time you finish the exam, you know the result, right? And this is not the exam we wrote in our colleges, did we? We didn't. So, this becomes, uh, the, uh, what I am trying to tell you here is that learning today is becoming online learning. About three years ago, if I am in a university LLM lecture means, we always go to the college, uh, meet the students, speak to them, interact with them, which it's a long process. Now, uh, we, are, we are meeting through the computer, halfway through my connection goes. So the point I'm trying to tell you here is, online learning, online testing has come to stay. You have to accept that. This has made a very big difference to the education. So I suggest that, you know, you download Udemy, do a name check, and if you are going to take the University Grants Commission examination, I have put up one complete module on international law. You are going to have 10 units there actually, and I have put one module on industrial property right. I have put another module on law of patent, and one on the law relating to the environment and biodiversity, 
So what I'm trying to tell you is, you know, Professor Khan, I think you can ask your library to have this kind of online video lectures also. Uh, for for anyway, uh, I, I want all of you to check it out because now these brands are becoming more famous. Amazon is going to get into this. Please remember, how many of you are planning to take civil services? I actually, I look at myself as an empowering teacher. Empowering teacher is not the one who gives you education. I would like to see that you become employable and when you get employed, you get a good wage. That is very important. And the wage you are going to get is going to depend on the skill set. See, it is not that, you know, what is the Archimedes principle? Nobody is asking you this question today. They are asking, will ask you, by applying the Archimedes principle, how are you going to build a submarine? That is what is the uh, use of science, actually. Convert anyway, the point is a trademark, okay? I said because education is one of the important services business today. Like uh, hospitality, like healthcare, like transportation, like banking, like insurance, okay? And Online education is becoming a very important uh, method. So what we are all these things we are talking about, here it becomes brand driven. Okay. People should know that uh, if I go via this, I will get a quality that will conform to particular norm. So, and what that is the best way is by having what you call as a trademark protection. And in trademark protection, what you can do is, you have to make sure that uh, brand, which is not generic, the brand, which is not laudatory, the brand that does not offend the religious sensibilities of the people. For example, if I were to have a triple X rum under the brand name Lost to Profit, many will get annoyed. And if I want to put a condom with the name uh, Celibate Monk, this is, I mean, you, you are offending the religious sensibilities of the group of people. You should avoid that actually, okay? In fact, I don't know how many of you will remember, you must have seen in the newspaper, a stand-up comedian has been barred from conducting the shows. He has been hugely successful otherwise and many times, you know, he puts up shows uh, which get subscribed fairly well. So the point is, under, uh, see, you are in business, right? Uh, how, I wanted to ask you, how many of you have heard of this movie J.B.? J.B., did you watch it? Yes, sir, I watched it. You watched it, okay. Yes. I think I asked about it in my yesterday's class also. So the point I'm trying to tell you here is that J.B. producers are having a lot of plot from one particular community which happens to be a dominant community in Tamil Nadu. Uh, so much so that the hero who acted in that movie will not get theatres uh, if the, if the movies are, you must have known about that Rani Padmavat, uh, what do you call, uh, some particular community getting very offended because, you know, uh, you are going to project her in a bad light even before the movie is released actually. Sometimes even the producers like this kind of uh, pre-release publicity for them to make money and I don't want to go into again. Copyright is a very important thing uh, and in the copyright uh, things are changing. You know why? Uh, if you are talking about a Shah Rukh Khan movie, Amitabh Pachan movie, Amitabh Pachan is I think uh, is more a model than an actor today, okay. Uh, uh. For example, I know more about Tamil movies, okay. 
There is one Rajnikant and there is one Kamalhasan. Okay, these guys are the two dominant actors. Uh, each movie is something like hundred crore budget, right? Lot of money here, eh? and probably the hero will take about sixty percent of it. The heroine will probably take about twenty percent of it if she is lucky, eh? and in Bombay. Uh, people like uh, what is that uh, lady here or Kannadiga girl? That uh, Deepika. Ah, Deepika Padukone. Okay, she is demanding a wage uh, which is as good as the heroine. Malika Sharavat, I think, tried to do the same, but uh, she couldn't get roles and she had to migrate to the Hollywood. You understand what I'm saying? So, if I'm trying, what I'm trying to tell you here is. This is a movie industry. If you look at it earlier, there used to be one. What do you call production house? Raj Kapoor. Okay, there were R K Studios. There were a production house. There were a lot of actors in the family because they were a production house. They could decide which actors are. If you understand what I am saying, they decide the wage. For example, Kamala Hassan will produce a movie. In that he will do a cameo role. The hero would have been paid two crore. Kamala Hassan will take five crore because he is a producer. You understand what I am saying? And he has decides the cast, and he decides the director. He decides the wage. And uh, nowadays, you know, the movies is getting very interesting. And uh, uh, it is uh, important also because recently. I saw a Tamil commercial movie, which was made solely by an Apple iPhone. You wouldn't believe the quality. So, if you have an Apple iPhone, uh, you can make a movie. In fact, the Apple iPro 13 advertised as saying that this will enable you to make Hollywood quality movies. And the sound system will match that of the Dolby, right? Dolby. Okay, that is the famous sound system. So you are having products which are bringing to the common man high quality product. For example, you know, uh, we have when I was a college teacher, photography used to be a bloody expensive hobby here. Films used to cost a uh, hundred buck uh, when our salary used to be about three thousand, and for developing and washing the film, thirteen print, sixteen or thirty-two prints will cost you five hundred rupee, which will become one sixth of your salary actually. You know, you understand what I am saying? And you are talking about the fancy lens, tripods, all those things. You know, only. Very big people. In fact, Dada Sahib Palke, who made the first movie in India, went to England to learn about cinematography. He made the movie. Okay, he died in penury. Okay, because there were no theatres in the country at that time to exhibit the movies he had made. After more theatres were built and the technology improved, like in Tamil Nadu. M. G. Ramachandran becomes the chief minister, followed by Jayalalitha. In uh, Andhra Pradesh, N. T. Rama Rao becomes the chief minister. In I wouldn't be surprised, you know, in many other places, you know, even Chaturvedi Suna. If you look at it, he was a health minister. Uh, as he was a health minister, he was appearing in cigarette and liquor advertisements. Actually, okay, that is the. Kind of uh, the technology that has uh, now, if you look at it, uh, movie financing had become far more transparent. Okay, there have been a lot of low-budget movies which are big success. Okay, so uh, the technology had. Substantially reduce the gap, okay, uh, of the difference between poor and rich. 
For example, why should good lecture be restricted to the students of IIT and the famous law school? Cannot all lectures be available in Australia? Uh, postgraduate education is done like that. You don't have to go to the university because the distances are so much. You may be working in your farm, which is about a 10 or 15 acre or a 20 acre, and you will be pursuing your postgraduation. So they tell you the class, you sit in the class, and that's all they have been doing even before COVID. <coughs> in the state of Darwin in Australia, where the population density is not so high. So you stay in your farm, attend a class, go to the university to write the examination and take a degree. Uh, all that is happening and you know. So one more thing that uh, we have to appreciate as a professional is trade secret. Okay. Now what is this trade secret? Mm, this is a very interesting. When I say trade secret, what comes to your mind? Is there any real trade secret in the world? It's a Coca-Cola. Ah, good. Everybody will say it. But let me tell you, there's no big deal about Coca-Cola. Because, see, you know, if you call cola, it is generic. Right? Pepsi Cola. Huh? Uh, there was something called uh, what cola? Arabic Cola, there was one. Uh, Mecca Cola. Huh? Uh, during that uh, uh, Iraqi occupation of all that, you know. Uh, see, they thought that these American companies, you know, and Coca Cola sells best in Middle East actually. Coca Cola, 7 Up. Panta Orange, Mirinda, uh, Thumbs Up is purely an Indian brand. It is a parley uh, led brand actually. Now, people, the biggest myth of the world is the formula of Coca-Cola is a secret. And the company says, uh, it is known only to two people. Uh, the company only makes the concentrate and exports it to different places around the world and ask other people who are called as franchisees to bottle it with sugar, water and carbon dioxide. That is a business model of Coca-Cola. And Coca-Cola as a brand is as popular as Saridon. Okay. Which are available in about 180 countries actually. Now, they say that it is known only to two of our people and that is kept in this wallet and that wallet can only be opened by these two people and these two people don't stay in the same town, they don't go to the same hotel, they don't attend the same dinner. If both of them die at the same time, world will not have the Coca-Cola formula. My immediate response is no big loss. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? This is a, what do you call a non-essential product, okay? The, you know, I see uh, 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 Indra Nui, you have heard about her? Indra Nui? Who is she? She was the ex-CEO of Coca-Cola, she resigned like No, 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 she was not in Coca-Cola. PepsiCo. Pepsi, ah. So what was she? She was the CEO. She was the CEO, correct. You know, she was a, a, a real Indian woman of substance. If I were to look for her, she didn't want to be seen as, a, what do you call, first woman CEO. She wanted to be seen as a, an economist from the third world country. You understand, you know. You are, I mean, the point I'm trying to tell you is, Pepsi Cola, leveraged itself in the global market because uh, Indira Nui was able to project healthier drinking options. But ultimately they were also selling this uh, uh, cola. But uh, if you have Tropicana brand, right? 
And we all love that. I actually have been a great fan of Tropicana, okay? And uh, they were promoting the health drink option. Now, Coca-Cola had to match it. What is their competing product on that? Minute milk or minute milk. Have you heard of that? Okay, don't worry. What I'm trying to tell you here is there is a brand, there is a what you call reflective brand. Yeah, you must have heard about, have you heard of Hun Academy? Sachin Tendulkar. Uh, but the other one I told you where I have put up courses is Udemy. See, but here, if you ask me whether there is confusion, people will say, you have to look at three things. Who are the target audience? Are the target audience illiterate, gullible people? Like who buy snuff, beadies, okay? Right, these guys uh, may not be very educated. He may not know the distinction between Taj Mahal and Red Fort, right? For him, both are palaces, that's all actually, okay? Uh, but at the same time, uh, a person who is a college-going person, when he is going for a computer, he knows the options. Fullerton, Packard, Dell, Samsung, Apple, okay? He knows the advantages. He knows, you know, he is what you call as a knowledgeable consumer. In law of pausing up, the test we see is, whom are we selling our commodities? If we are selling our commodities to a knowledgeable consumer, the possibility of deception is less. But if you are selling a shampoo, the consumer need not be knowledgeable here. He just has to have a sticky, sweaty hand. <laughs> if he has it, he will use a shampoo. And he'll use any shampoo and he may also have his choices actually. It is wrong to think that poor people do not exercise choice. In fact, uh, uh, people like Ambani became rich because they started uh, uh, delivering good quality product to poor people at reasonable rate with hefty profit margins. Uh, for example, have you heard of uh, uh, Ready Laboratory? Anji Reddy, he is a great man which all of you must remember because uh, he was actually a, a pharmacologist working with NDPL, National Drugs and Pharmaceutical Limited. Uh, he came up with brilliant ideas. His boss called him and told him, look buddy, you become an entrepreneur. If you are working with government, okay, your next to promotion will come after five years. And if people find you so much smart, people will trip you up. So he took his boss's advice and started Dr. Reddy Laboratories. And this Reddy Laboratories had become the biggest generic drug supplier in the world. The Reddy Laboratory experience in North India, you had Hamid, Sipla. Right. And in Delhi, you had uh, Ranbaxi, okay. Uh, they are now under a lot of cloud and I don't want to go into it. It was started by their father, Cadilla. So India became what you call as a generic drug manufacturer of the world. So the point I'm trying to tell you here is that, and one more I'm done with that. So you have to have patent skill. You have to have trademark skill. And you have to have copyright skill in terms of what do you call. Copyright is relatively easy. And the last one, if I do it, I am done with the clause actually. Namely, trade secret. And that is why I started my talk on Coca-Cola. Okay. See, in trade secret, first thing I want you to appreciate is there is no such thing as a well-kept secret. <laughs> First, I want you to understand. If a product comes in the market, there is something called reverse engineering. 
Okay. Uh, there are I mean, I will not care how my computer works. I will be happy so long as it works. There may be quite a few people who would like to know how it works. For example, repair. You know the Apple product? No consumer can repair it. It is impossible to open the Apple I Nobody can open that. Because Apple believes that if anyone opens it, all the trade secrets will be wide open. There is no such thing as a repair. What you can do is, you can give back the old product, get a reasonable exchange value. That is how the whole model works. And uh, the company, they will know how to open it. Nobody, you cannot open an uh, Apple iPad. There is no way. And if there is going to be an improvement to the Apple, Apple will come up with a new software and that software will get automatically uploaded in your Apple iPad when you are in Wi-Fi or in a network and thereafter it works. So what they do to make a trade secret is three type of obligations are imposed. First one is non-compete. If you take an employment with Wipro, TCS, Accenture, you will be a software developer and your contract of employment will say, look here, uh, in the event of your leaving, you cannot take a job with Wipro, TCS, Accenture. Because during our period of employment, during your period of employment with us, we have disclosed a lot of trade secrets. And if you are going to work in these companies, unwittingly, you will end up disclosing these secrets to our business competitor. This is called as non-compete. With my competitors, you should not work. You should not also work in the same area for which I was giving you salary. Uh, this is called as the watchtower doctrine. You know, I take you in a watchtower. From the watchtower, you look at the places around. And I take you to the watchtower because I want you to do some work which uh, you can do better because I take you there. Now, when you get out, you cannot give up my employment and start doing it yourself. You know, this is a very famous case called Springboard Doctrine. Just look at it and, you know, Sears versus Copy Dex is the name of the case actually. So, as per the Springboard Doctrine, but for you, uh, I wouldn't get the information. Now, after having got the information, you are legitimate in putting upon me a non-compete with obligation, whether it is reasonable. Two, non-poaching. What is it? I told you the patent portfolio of Novartis will be managed by TCS here. They have outsourced it. Patent professionals are expensive in Europe and America. Uh, patent professionals are not so expensive in India. So, if Novartis is going to have 3,000 patents around the world, the prosecution can be done in India. He will generate the work and uh, uh, he will handle all the office objections and tell the various people to respond to it. This is a patent prosecution work, is a big outsourcing work. Uh, technologists, lawyers, everybody is making a big killing actually. Okay, well paid professionals. Now what happens? When they leave, I am working for Wipro. But the work I do will be for Novartis. Now Wipro and Novartis will have an agreement that I am going to send some people to work for you. You shouldn't take that person away. This is called as non-poaching. On a case-by-case -case basis, exemption is given. 
You will, if you have a regular employment contract, you will have all that actually. The third one is non-disclosure. Okay, whatever it is here, this information you should not disclose to others. But please remember, do you know section 27 of the Indian Contract Act? We are coming to the end of the lecture. What is section 27 of the Indian Contract Act? <laughs> Sometimes I ask a very basic question, right? And let me tell you as a lawyer, most of the problems our clients are going to face, you know, are simple problems. If you know the basics, and if you know how to apply the basic, you will solve the problem. You don't have to do research actually. Suddenly the net is hanging actually. Hmm? Okay, I think it is God. <coughs> Working, right? Yes, sir. Huh? Yeah. It's gone actually, yeah. All right. Now I think I have got you are hearing me? Are you people hearing me? Ah, okay, good, all right. I'm glad, because I wasn't hearing you, all right. Never mind. Uh, most of the problems that we are going to face in our professional life, if we know the basics, and if we know how to apply the basics, we'll be able to solve their problem, actually, okay? Uh, but, we like to do research. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Uh, Section 27 of the Indian Contract Act says, Agreement in restraint of trade shall be void. For example, you, I am an IP lawyer. You are from Indore. You say that I want to learn IP law work from you. I say, please come. We work with me. But uh, after two or three years, you would have learned all the IP law from me. And I would have introduced you most of my clients. And... Uh, if you start your own IP lawyering, don't start it at Bangalore. You understand? If you do it, you will be a competitor for me. And you will take away most of my clients, non-poaching. You understand? This kind of agreement, routine, if you are going to join a law firm, like Anand and Anand, uh, Rempri and Sagar, Depending and Depending, Lakshmi Kumaran and Sagar, all these things, this is what you call as a big law firm. They have asked you to sign non-compete and non-poaching. In fact, many times, they themselves will gladly give up the non-poaching clause and say, if this company wants to hire you, we have no problem. You understand? Most of the people who join Amarchand Mangalda Shroff, okay, A, Z, B and partners, they are all coming to recruit from your place, Lahomir, right? They all come for, no, they don't, huh? They should start coming, actually. All right. <laughs> now, they will be having this kind of contract, okay? That is what is an important thing. Uh, the law makes a distinction between a reasonable restraint of trade and an unreasonable restraint, okay? Now, it is you as a lawyer who should make sure that the restraint does not become unreasonable. Now, how to make the restraint reasonable? Restrict it in period of time. Two years from the date of termination of the contract. Reasonable. Restrict it to the area of industry. For example, I hire you as my patent paralegal. I say, don't practice patent law, but if you want to practice trademark law, copyright law, design law, by all means go ahead. Uh, restrict it to a specific area of industry. Third, geography. Start whatever you want here, patent, trademark, copyright, design. But only thing is, don't take my client and don't practice in Bangalore. This will be what you call as a reasonable restraint. And I think... Uh, that is all I have had to say and uh, 
I told you, did you read Whitfield and Jorovich, Solomon about uh, wrongful imprisonment after the class is over? No, huh? You should do your research actually. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks, uh, Professor Amir, that you could give me an opportunity. And uh, I strongly recommend you girls to check up my Udemy profile. Okay. First lectures in Udemy are always free. You understand? You can make up your mind. Two, uh, they have a policy where you use it for a month, <laughs> you can ask for a refund if you are not satisfied. Three, it is lifetime access and you can, you know, exchange it between yourself. And I'll be glad if you check my, my profile. I've got focused courses on IPR, patent, uh, private, uh, public international law, etc. Nice meeting you all and uh, thank you very much, Professor Amir Khan, for the kind invitation. Thank you, sir. And Thank you. On behalf of Chindalu family, I would like to thank you, sir, for providing an insight on uh, small enterprises and their relations. Also, on uh, academic institutions. Sir, uh, it was a wonderful experience and a learning experience for all of us. And indeed, it was insightful, spirited, and elegantly crafted account of public uh, interest with the emerging IP trends. And... Uh, I would like to thank you also, sir, for sharing us with the detailed narratives and sparing your valuable time with us. And uh, uh, on behalf of the Chenilu family, I would like to <coughs> I would.